Good evening. President Reagan, in the words of the latest medical bulletin, is doing extremely well. Scarcely 12 hours after the removal of a would-be assassin's bullet from his lung, Mr. Reagan signed a bill freezing milk price supports. He has been seeing aides and members of his family and reportedly is in good spirits and joking. White House Press Secretary James Brady, shot in the head and gravely wounded, reportedly has made extraordinary progress after brain surgery. A hospital spokesman said today, we believe he is going to live, but we have no idea where he is going to end up. A Secret Service agent and a Washington policeman, also wounded in yesterday's six-shot fusillade from a 22 caliber pistol, are said to be recovering satisfactorily. The man accused of the shooting, John Warnock Hinckley, Jr., left an unmailed letter reportedly revealing an obsessive infatuation for a young actress and saying that he might do something to get himself killed. Fred Graham reports. Washington sources have reported that Hinckley told police he shot President Reagan because he believed the president had snubbed a young film actress with whom Hinckley was infatuated. The actress is 18-year-old Jodie Foster, shown here in the film Foxes, playing a scene between a young girl and her mother. Photos of Ms. Foster were reportedly found in Hinckley's wallet when he was arrested. According to the sources, Hinckley told a vague story of being obsessed with Ms. Foster and of feeling that Ronald Reagan had snubbed or affronted her. Hinckley reportedly wouldn't or couldn't explain in what way he felt the president had snubbed the young actress. A spokesman for Yale University, where Ms. Foster is a freshman, said that she had been asked by the FBI to say nothing about Hinckley, but she was quoted as saying that she has never met or spoken to him. Prosecutors filed court papers today saying they had found items in a search of Hinckley's hotel room here and asking the court to seal the results to protect Hinckley from adverse pretrial publicity. Sources said that among the items found in the hotel room was a letter addressed to Ms. Foster and unmailed. In it were said to be statements to Ms. Foster saying that Hinckley was so unhappy and distraught that he had decided to do something that would get him killed. Fred Graham, CBS News, Washington. The late afternoon medical report from the White House physician says the president continues on the road to recovery. More about the president now from Leslie Stahl. After sleeping this morning, the president spent the day reading newspapers. He sat up in bed for a while and began taking clear liquids, soup, and some gelatin. The hospital spokesman, Dr. Dennis O'Leary, said the president had an excellent night, that all his vital signs are entirely normal. He's on almost no medication, and the likelihood of any post-operative complications are quite, quite small. Uh, I think that he is uh, quite capable of making uh, decisions, interacting with, with people. Uh, I wouldn't encourage him to put in an 18-hour day, but uh, I am sure that he can attend to the important matters of government. To show that the president is in command, the White House released an act that he signed early this morning, and a spokesman said the president remains the president. Doctors gave out more details about the injury. At first, Mr. Reagan thought he merely cracked a rib, but when he arrived at the hospital yesterday, one of the paramedics on duty said it was clear the injury was more serious. As he got to the second set of double doors, he just kind of collapsed onto, onto the floor there, and he looked kind of pale like he was in apprehensive and in some pain at that time. Did he say anything and was he conscious? He was conscious and alert. He didn't say anything to me. My partner kind of grabbed him under his legs and took him into the back and he mentioned to my partner that he was having a hard time breathing. The president's top White House aides and his family visited him today. Mrs. Reagan was present shortly after 12 noon when the president was told for the first time that his press secretary, James Brady, had been wounded. To that, the president said, Oh, damn, oh, damn, and his eyes welled up with tears. He was told that the agent and the policeman, who were also shot, were fine and recovering. About spokesman Brady, doctors say that he will in all likelihood survive, but they have no idea how complete his recovery will be. Preparations were made throughout the day to set up an office of the president at George Washington Hospital, where security remained tight. Overwhelming numbers of flowers have been arriving. Thousands and thousands of phone calls and telegrams have been pouring in. At the White House, officials insisted that over the past two days, the administration has been prepared at all times to deal with any contingency. When the president, who has maintained a sense of humor, was told that the government was running normally, he responded, what makes you think I'd be happy about that? Leslie Stahl, CBS News, the White House. 
At one point in the hospital today, President Reagan noticed so many top aides around him that he reportedly asked, who's running the store? Today it was clear that Vice President Bush was running the store, that is, handling the routine details. Bush was careful not to appear to be assuming the power of the presidency. The White House said that when Bush presided at a cabinet meeting this morning, he sat in the vice president's, not the president's chair. When I shoot a great champion like Ben Crenshaw, history can happen at any time, and that's why I stay ready all the time with my Canon AE-1. The zoom lens puts me right where the action is. So if Ben gets that one miracle shot, I get it too. Ben, you try the zoom. Sure. Even with the zoom, the Canon AE-1 is as easy as focus and click. The incomparable Canon AE-1, so advanced, it's simple. Give your broken bracelets and beer steins to Elmer's Wonderbomb Plus. Give us a break. Give us a break. Give us a break. Give your broken hat racks and handbags to new Wonderbomb Plus for wood and leather. Give us a break. Give us a break. Give us a break. Give Elmer's almost any break. Our unique package puts super strong glue right where you want it. So stick with a name you can trust. Elmer's. Give us a break. Relations between Secretary of State Haig and the White House senior staff were strained almost to the breaking point last week over who would head a so-called crisis management team. Haig lost that battle to Vice President Bush. But when the first post-struggle crisis developed yesterday, it was Haig who appeared to move quickly to try to manage the situation. And this has stretched even thinner those already strained relations. Diane Sawyer has more on this. For the second time in two weeks, the Secretary of State is the object of controversy at the White House. In particular, his unexpected, agitated appearance before reporters yesterday. As of now, I am in control here in the White House pending return of the vice president and in, in close touch with him. It turns so, out that Haig appeared entirely on his own initiative. No one disputes that Haig was in charge of liaison with the vice president and with the hospital. But White House Chief of Staff Jim Baker and Counselor Ed Meese were surprised and annoyed, sources say, when Haig appeared on television. The vice president, en route back to Washington, was equally surprised to see Haig on his airplane TV screen. And sources say many of the cabinet officers meeting with Haig downstairs at the White House had no idea why the Secretary of State had disappeared. These sources say when Haig returned to the Situation Room, he had an argument with Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger because his statement had encroached on Weinberger's turf. Haig's spokesman said today the Secretary had simply tried to project stability in light of Soviet activity in Poland. Secretary Haig at that point felt it was important to reassure our allies that there was continuity of government here in the United States. And White House officials insisted today they did approve Haig's statement after the fact, and they gave this version of that tense and turbulent day. The government did not skip a beat. Uh, the White House performed effectively. Uh, there was not a, a single ripple. Uh, it was a complete spirit of cooperation. But despite the soothing statements, several senior White House staffers say Haig's performance reopened the old wounds. People were numb. They couldn't believe it, one Haig critic said, adding, it was like being at a funeral and suddenly some guy gets up and starts tap dancing. Diane Sawyer, CBS News at the State Department. CBS News congressional correspondent Phil Jones reports tonight that new trouble for Haig appears to be building on Capitol Hill. Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker, trying to answer questions today, said, quote, had there been a national emergency, the vice president would not have been the command authority, end of quotation. Representative Barbara Mikulski of Baltimore demands an investigation. Senator Joseph Biden of Delaware said, quote, this is the first chapter of a book Haig will wish he never had his hands on. Later in this broadcast, we'll take a long look at the background of John Warnock Hinckley, Jr., and CBS News will have more on the aftermath of the assassination attempt in a special broadcast at 11.30, 10.30 Central Time tonight. From the halls of Congress to the corner saloon, comments about yesterday's shootings in Washington reflected a belief that violence in American society increasingly threatens everyone, from the president to the ordinary citizen. And the FBI today released figures supporting that view. 
The Bureau says that violent crime took its biggest jump in a dozen years during 1980, up 13%. Major crime, that is crime combining violent crime with the more common property crime, rose by 10%, the sharpest increase in five years. New York led the nation in murders and robberies, followed by Los Angeles and Chicago, but Miami reports a 67% increase in major crime, the largest percentage jump in the country. Word that President Reagan is recovering rapidly helped send the stock market up sharply today. How long does a John Deere lawn tractor last? 10 or 15 years is not unusual, which means with ordinary use, you could mow a path from New York, across Pennsylvania, through Indiana, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, Utah, all the way to the West Coast. Imagine mowing clear across America. Just think how many times you could mow your lawn. John Deere, you may pay a little more, but they'll last. We're showing Tom that one ounce of whole wheat total has 100% of the recommended daily allowance of these nine important vitamins plus iron. Tom, what cereal did you have for breakfast? Uh, cornflakes. How do you think one ounce of cornflakes will compare with total? I don't know. Total looks tough to beat. Let's compare. Total's much higher. If you want 100% of these nine vitamins and iron, get total. That's a real difference. That's the total difference. The list of murdered or missing black children in Atlanta grew to 23 today. An autopsy provided the tragic resolution to a disagreement between one family and the police. Pam Olson explains. The body was identified as 13-year-old Timothy Hill, missing since March 11th. His body was found yesterday tangled in debris in the Chattahoochee River on the outskirts of Atlanta. Dental records aided in the identification of Timothy's decomposed body. The Fulton County Medical Examiner said he probably died of asphyxiation, and his case fits the all-too-familiar pattern. No marks, no mutilation, uh, no telltale signs, cult marks, or anything of that nature at all. Timothy lived several blocks away from another reported missing child, Joseph Bell, but Timothy's name was never assigned to the special task force investigating the murders and disappearances of 22 other children. Before the identification was made, Atlanta Mayor Maynard Jackson explained why Timothy had not been added to the list. There have been recurring, continuous reports of Timothy Hill having been sighted alive in recent days. He is still considered to be a runaway by the Atlanta police at this time. But that was not to be, as Atlanta's police chief consoled the grieving family several hours later. Pam Olson, CBS News, Atlanta. Since 1955, we've developed over 70 different toothpastes. Not one has been able to beat Crest at fighting cavities. But finally, after 26 years, one succeeded. It was tested in the largest clinical studies ever done on any toothpaste. Three solid years, over 10,000 dental examinations on thousands of kids like these. And these tests showed that this new toothpaste can give you significantly better cavity protection than Crest. Introducing new advanced formula press with the new cavity fighting system, Floristat. And how much better was new press shown to be? Look, old press gave you this much cavity protection. New press gives you significantly more, which can mean fewer cavities with press than you ever got before. All new advanced formula crest because any cavity you get is too many cavities. Oh, it's accepted by the American Dental Association. Thailand's year-old government of Prime Minister Prem, rocked by scandal and stymied by economic troubles, was overthrown today by the Thai military. The state radio said that the deputy commander-in-chief of the army was heading a revolutionary committee following Prem's resignation. It is not believed that Prem was arrested. A divided leadership of Poland's independent union Solidarity voted tonight to formally call off plans for that general strike that had been scheduled for today. But at a stormy eight-hour meeting in Gdansk, the union refused to ratify the latest labor agreement with the Warsaw government, thus leaving a strike threat very much alive. Bert Quint reports from Warsaw. 
We left Bowenza, came out of the negotiation, saying there would be no strike today. It seemed that all of Poland took a deep and joyful breath. It was now Bowenza's task to convince fellow union leaders that the agreement he said made him 70% happy was good enough. For many, it wasn't. The Warsaw Region branch called the agreement vague and complained that Bowens had been forced to back down on some major demands. The feeling was, we will have to continue the battle another day. Members of Solidarity's National Commission weren't convinced they should ratify the agreement, but they had to do something about the strike that was ordered for today. Shortly before midnight, they voted to call it off. This would take the pressure off while they continued talking. Poland tonight seems to have survived another crisis, but the relief may be only temporary. The Communist Party appears still divided, solidarity less solid, and Moscow continues to insist on a crackdown. Bert Quinn, CBS News, Warsaw. DeWitt Wallace, who parlayed an idea other publishers said wouldn't work into a magazine with an estimated monthly circulation of 100 million, died last night in Mount Kisco, New York. Wallace, who was 91, is survived by his wife, the former Lila Bell Atchison, with whom he started the Reader's Digest in a Greenwich Village basement in 1922. Certain that readers wanted a magazine of condensed articles, Wallace himself copied the first stories from periodicals in the New York Public Library with permission of the editors. At his death, the Reader's Digest, built on what was called Wallace's infallible instinct for middle-class tastes, was published in 40 editions in more than 160 nations. Enid Bagnold, the British playwright and novelist, died in her London home today. She also was 91. Miss Bagnold wrote six novels and 10 plays, including the stage hits, The Chalk Garden, and A Matter of Gravity. But she is best remembered for her novel, National Velvet, which provided Elizabeth Taylor's first Hollywood starring role. Johnny, you know more European vacation in Spain than anywhere else. Really? They go to see the Alhambra of Granada and all the great art. That's nice. They love Spanish food. I am hungry. Me too. Johnny, there is more than castles in Spain. I know. And good sports too. It's all right. Lower prices on food, fares, and fine hotels. Come to Spain. A lot more vacation for a lot less money. You like? I like. Okay. It's all right. I like having lots of horses, and I got them from Sears. Sears, new bold breed of lawn and garden tractors, up to 24 horsepower for most every purpose. Designed to ride smooth and handle easy. Even priced so big horsepower makes good horse sense. Now save $100 to $500 on these bold breed models. Save $120 on this 10-horse lawn tractor, now $849. For power and performance, you can count on Sears. Just who is John Hinckley, Jr., the sandy-haired young man who thrust himself into the nation's attention with a few seconds of pistol fire? A federal prosecutor answers, a wandering, aimless, irresponsible young man. We have a series of reports on Hinckley's background, beginning with David Dick in Dallas. Beverly Drive, one of the most prestigious streets in one of the most exclusive communities in the state of Texas, Highland Park an enclave of wealth and political conservatism surrounded by the city of Dallas. In this neighborhood, which includes homes of families such as Bunker Hunt and Governor Bill Clements, here in this house, John Hinckley Jr. spent his adolescent and teenage years. A classmate recalled today how it was as he and the Hinckley youth were growing up. Uh, he never really went out of his way to make himself known. He never said anything to me to what he felt about different things, but He's always the kind of guy that you liked having around. I was extremely shocked to find out that someone that I thought was incapable of attempting to assassinate a president could be John Hinckley. He wasn't like a student communist or a drug addict or anything like that when he was in junior high and high school. He uh, seemed pretty all-American, as a matter of fact. As an American citizen, I'm appalled at what he's done, and I can't, I can't forgive him for that. On the other hand, I'll always be loyal to one of my friends. After their graduation from high school in 1973, Kirk Dooley and his friend John Hinckley left for college to Texas Tech University. And there, they lost touch with each other. David Dick, CBS News, Dallas. At Texas Tech University in Lubbock, John Hinckley drifted into and out of school from 1973 to 1980. 
As a student, he made the dean's list once, but overall, his grades were fair when he was in school. Hinckley was not a campus joiner. He kept to himself. But in 1978, he was attracted off campus to the neo-Nazis. And in St. Louis, Hinckley took part in a National Socialist Party rally, a Nazi party official claimed. However, Hinckley broke with the organization after an apparent dispute over tactics. Party members said Hinckley wanted to shoot people and blow up buildings. When someone comes to us and starts advocating us shooting people and blowing things up, we, it's like uh, just a natural reaction. We just make the assumption that uh, the guy is either a nut or he's a federal agent trying to entrap us. Hinckley lived in Spartan motel-style apartment buildings during his years at Texas Tech. And an apartment maintenance man remembered a talk with Hinckley over his distaste for politicians. Opinion of this person uh, was that he thought that they should all be illuminated. In September 1980, this pawn shop sold Hinckley a 22 caliber pistol. The shop owner will not talk about the sale because he said he was afraid now of possible threats on his life. This pawn shop also sold Hinckley weapons, a 30 caliber revolver and a rifle. And now the owner of this store fears for his life too. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Lubbock, Texas. Security officers say John Hinckley flew to Nashville October 7th last year, the same day President Reagan was scheduled to make a campaign appearance here. Mr. Reagan's Nashville appearance was canceled, and Hinckley checked into the Downtowner Motel, where he made six or seven local phone calls. On October 9th, he attempted to take an American Airlines flight to New York, but when he approached the airport security checkpoint, Evelyn Brannon became suspicious. He was very nervous. He was just shaking. And his clothes looked like you were in a hurry. You just throw them in the bag. There weren't nothing packed. It was all scrambled up and it smelled awful when you opened the bag. When she and Officer John Lynch looked through the small suitcase, they found two 22 caliber pistols, one 38 caliber pistol, one pair of handcuffs, and 50 rounds of ammunition. Officer Lynch arrested Hinckley and immediately removed him from the airport because President Carter was due there within two hours. Notify the FBI. Our procedure is we do notify the FBI if the individual or individuals uh, bear a ticket for an airline, which he did, and the FBI was notified, not the Secret Service. Hinckley was taken to jail at 3.13 in the afternoon, where he was charged with carrying a weapon. He was fined 62.50 by a local judge and released 34 minutes later. He claimed the weapons were all new and were purchased for target practice. When the Nashville police checked the weapons today, they found one of them had been fired. Your opinion is it's been fired? In my opinion, yes. Uh, according to the barrel, the uh, dirt and corrosion in it, it, it definitely looks like it's been fired. A closer examination of the 50 rounds of ammunition also revealed, according to Sergeant Clary, that these are extra-powerful hollow-point bullets, which expand after impact and are not normally used for target practice. Normal use is... Uh, Shooting it at, at some person or, or something like that is not something that you would uh, shoot at, we'll say, birds or something like that. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Nashville. The distraught family of John Hinckley Jr. remains secluded in a neighbor's home today. Finally, a spokesman emerged to express the family's condolences to yesterday's victims. Mr. and Mrs. Hinckley have been longtime supporters of President Reagan. Uh, they plan to see their son, John. At this time, however, they have no definite travel plans. They spoke with their son, John, last night and again by phone today. Little is known of young Hinckley's intermittent life in this affluent neighborhood, but some family friends were aware of his father's concern for him. Among them, Bob Ainsworth, who accompanied Hinckley's father on a Christian relief mission to Africa last fall. It was primarily with... Uh with the fact that his son didn't seem to have any direction in life. And certainly during our time, there was no indication of uh, the deep kind of trouble that evidently his son uh, was in. Nor in the Denver Motel, where Hinckley lived earlier this month, were there signs of an impending assassination attempt. There was never any guns or bullets or uh, anything like that laying around in his room. No. Though Hinckley had applied for work in Denver's two major newspapers, state records indicate no trace of formal employment in Colorado. 
An FBI source says last night's search of the Hinckley home revealed no indication that young Hinckley was acting with any group or individual. What we did find, said the source, was the kind of thing that would help a defense based on what he called mental processes. David Dow, CBS News, Denver. Early this morning, after John Hinckley was denied bail, he was taken by motorcade about 40 miles south to a Marine Corps jail in Quantico, Virginia. He remains there, guarded by 25 federal marshals segregated from the Marine prisoners. Today, we found out a bit more about the would-be assassin. He is believed to have arrived in Washington Sunday by Greyhound bus, from where we are not sure. We do know that he checked into the Park Central Hotel, two blocks from the White House, ironically, right across the street from Secret Service headquarters, and out-of-town agents often stay at the same hotel. Hinckley's room number, 312, no view of the street, and we don't know what he did Sunday night. 8.30 Monday morning, the manager of this coffee shop thinks Hinckley had breakfast at the counter. We know that at 10 a.m. the maid entered room 312. Hinckley was not there. The maid said that she did not have enough towels and pillowcases to complete her cleaning job, so she returned after lunch. It was 1.15, about an hour and a quarter before the assassination attempt. The maid knocked, Hinckley asked her what she wanted, and she was admitted to complete her job. She described him as casually dressed, said a suitcase was lying on the bed, it was open, had lots of stuff in it. She left, and she may have been the last person to see Hinckley on the third floor of this hotel. From here to the Hilton Hotel, it is a short trip. 20 to 30 minutes walking, 8 to 10 by car, taxi fare is $2 and a quarter. In some way, Hinckley ended up here, and at least one person was suspicious of him. He didn't look the same as a normal tourist that lines up to see the president or the press that generally stands out here by the press rope. It was 2.26 p.m. Lem Tucker, CBS News, Washington. That's our report for this Tuesday. Dan Rather, CBS News, New York. Good night. Oh, hi, Betty. Hi. Want to borrow some Triscuit? They're right behind you. Pass me a box, too. Marty called, and he's bringing some guests. Hey, try one. Okay. What do you think? Great, huh? Mmm. These Triscuit wafers are really something. Like a whole snack menu in one box. I don't know about you, but I use Nabisco's Triscuits with anything, hot or cold. They're so firm and crunchy. Oops, gotta go. He's on time for once. Don't forget your Triscuits. Susan, our new album just made the charts. Oh, that's great. Let's have some coffee. Oh, I love some. Whoa. Only half a cup? I thought you liked my coffee. Mmm. I love the rich taste. It's the caffeine I can do without. Me too. That's why we're drinking Brim decaffeinated coffee. This is Brim? This is Brim freeze-dried. And it's decaffeinated so you don't have to stop at half a cup. If it tastes this rich, I don't want to stop. Fill it to the rim. With Brim? Right. <laughs> Fill your cup to the rim with the richness of Brim. This has been the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather.